we utilized third parties on our digital component of legacy PeerFit before the deal. Before we actually merged the platforms, we just had a handshake and let PeerFit users go over to fit on. From the time that we made that available, I think it was about a month afterwards, we're looking at the data. We had 4X the amount of people activate their fit on account. Then we had our previous digital vendor for the last two years. Welcome back to the Fit Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Jovene. Today I'm joined by Ed Buckley, CEO of FitOn Health. In this episode, we discuss FitOn's 2022 acquisition of PeerFit, the corporate wellness platform Ed founded. We talk about the combined company's approach to serving customers, employers, and health plans. Plus, we cover how weight loss drugs, a challenging fundraising market, and consolidation are impacting the fitness industry. Let's get into it. The Fit Insider Podcast is brought to you by Jack Taylor, our exclusive PR partner. More than just PR, they're creative storytellers and brand builders who actually understand the health and wellness industry. To learn more, head to fit.co slash Jack Taylor. That's F-I-T-T dot C-O slash Jack Taylor. Hi, Ed. Welcome welcome back to Fit Insider. I should say it's been a minute, but uh, thanks for joining us. Excited to catch up. Thank you for having me. I think a few things have happened since uh, the last time we talked here. Probably a couple, right? Um, from a global pandemic to your business changing hands to now scaling a, an entire business B2B operation with inside a consumer uh, facing fitness app, fitness company. Uh, Yeah, uh, you've been busy, huh? I got a new polo, a new logo on my polo, but uh, yeah, it's it's a lot lot to to, to unpack today for sure. Cool. Maybe, okay, so kicking things off, listeners, probably a lot of folks in the industry definitely know you are familiar and formerly of PeerFit, now of Fit on Health. What's the kind of bio title role as it stands today? Sure. Great, great question. So CEO of Fit on Health. And if you think about like, what is Fit on Health? We took the number one in direct to consumer Fit on. We took Peer Fit and the merged entity on the B2B sides Fit on Health, right? So that's what we think about is just the infrastructure that was Peer Fit We've got the name Fit on Health, but that infrastructure, that org, those processes, those contracts, it's legacy peer fit, right? That's the best way to think about it. But we wanted to have a unified brand because it was a bit confusing when we would go in and say, hey, this is the peer fit platform. And then here's the Fit on platform. And then luckily, without getting ahead too much, we actually merged the platforms this year. So now it's all on one platform. So it would have been really awkward for us to keep calling ourselves peer fit. Yeah. And this is, so we're just running through the timetable. February of last year, the deal is announced. Uh, obviously, prior to that, we were, were in COVID, fitness industry, healthcare, everything kind of upside down all over the place. When did this conversation kind of start happening? What was the the aha moment or like, hey, I think we can make this work. And then that led to obviously making it happen. You know, it's interesting while telling the timeline of the story, I'll I'll actually interject some just advice and learnings that I had along the way. My mentor, Jim Phillip, who was a banker for many years, always said every time we had inbound from groups and they'd kind of kick the can around, he'd always say, listen, people who want to do a deal will do a deal. These groups that you've been talking to for weeks and months, they're not going to do a deal. And it played out to be true because... Lindsay and Russell reached out and we were, I mean, as aggressive as you could be into a deal in a way that it it taught me, I'm like, this is what a deal that's going to happen looks like versus, you know, the kind of fluffy inbound you get. Hey, are you interested? Let's kick the can around. So I had been on a panel with Lindsay, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And it was funny. I remember leaving the panel thinking, Oh, she, I hadn't met her before and thinking, well, she's, she's really sharp. Like I really enjoyed my, my time on the panel with her and, uh, it was mid 2021. We had just hit 140th on the Inc 5,000. Actually, not only did we get inbound from them, but we had inbound from a number of people that month. So it really was kind of like a, Ooh, which, which one should we think about? 
and uh, let's let's call that August 21. And it was obvious as an entrepreneur to be able to put a business that is best in class and for me to be able to go learn from two really great entrepreneurs. We've also said a bunch of exits. Lindsay was an early executive at Fitbit for those people who don't know. And I, I just thought, okay, if I'm betting on PeerFit on its own three years from now or PeerFit and FitOn, PeerFit with FitOn three years from now, which one, which stock would I rather hold? That was, honestly, that's the way I thought about it. And I just said, I think that this team can come together in a really special way. I think it sets us up in a really special way. And uh, the deal process was relatively smooth. And we were pretty much done with the deal paperwork in December. But no one was rushing to like meet end of year. So we took our time, let holidays lapse. And then just after the new year, closed the deal. Funny enough, from a timing perspective, they say time kills all deals. And so we like gave ourselves that extra month. We closed the deal, and the very next day, Russia invaded Ukraine. And we all were like, oh, thank God we did this deal, because funding just gets really wonky, right, anytime there's a global event like that, especially just coming out of COVID, which, you know, made people extra nervous. So we were glad we got the deal done when we did. Yeah, your your experience of, you know, potential M&A sounds like the the kind of cliche around product market fit. It's like, it, if you have to ask, it's like, you don't have it. And it's, it's the same thing with like, if you're wondering if like a deal is going to get done or if they're really interested, it's like probably not going to get done. So yeah, glad, glad that it did. And if folks aren't familiar, I've chatted with Lindsay on the podcast. You can check out that episode. It, and I think it was very interesting and insightful in terms of how they think about that consumer business. So paired with this conversation today really paints the full picture of what's happening. So you have this, you know, externally consumer app workouts, very much focused on, you know, kind of the broad D to C market of health and fitness and celebrity partnerships, influencer trainers, like all the things that you would think about when you think like consumer fitness, obviously peer fit and now fit on health, a much different, B2B business, how that works, what that looks like, who you're targeting, even from the high level, if folks aren't familiar, like how do you think about, you mentioned like this kind of legacy peer fit moving over, those contracts, obviously targeting that same kind of population. What does that look like? How do you go about running, operationalizing that business? And of course now integrating, you mentioned them now fully merging into one platform, like leveraging to some extent those resources and the overall brand to to continue to build and grow this thing. So it has unlocked and unleashed a lot of potential on our side of the house, right? On the B2B side of the house, on Unfit on, on Health. If you think about what it enabled us to do, and I'll just kind of run down all of these, we were using third parties for our digital aspect uh, in the past. So we're selling to health plans and employers the how to get your members into great fitness experiences. Obviously, in-person is not done by us, but neither was digital. And all of a sudden, that could be us. So we could have our hand on the wheel of what kind of roadmap, what do health plans want, what do employers want? Let's build that in there. That's where these courses came from, right? Kind of like these master classes that we built. So all of a sudden, the pitch to our potential clients are, we've got this amazing network of in-person experiences, and in the same platform, we've got digital. What would you like to see in that digital? You can have input on that on that perspective. And oh, by the way, it's the best in the category from almost every available metric. That's what we're bringing to the table. So that was like a check, good. Then the next one was, there was a number of segments within existing health plan partners where in person is just too expensive, right? It is an expensive benefit. And digital is a fairly cost-effective benefit if it's in-house. So now we can go to a partner that we already have and say, hey, you know those segments we never worked on together? Let's just roll out digital only. And we started landing and expanding in places that we, the legacy PeerFit side, never could, right? So that's where it really unleashed our sales team to be able to be like, ooh, let's help more of your members help plan A or potential health plan B. And then the last one, it was really funny. We announced the deal and I was in Las Vegas at a Medicare conference 
So my first day on the job was me taking a picture in Las Vegas, and we had a finalist presentation that day, and literally walk into the finalist presentation, and one of the women on the committee says, oh, fit on, I've been using fit on for years, I love it. That's a totally different perspective that, once again, we never had from a legacy perspective. So just like the immediate on paper of what we could do, some people thought at the time, just digital, mainly just in person, D to C and B to B. How, how, do you, how do you make that work? And it really should be like a Harvard Business Review case study on the ways to do a merger the right way, culturally, organizationally, and frankly, product. Just to put it in from a numbers perspective, our B2B side has grown almost 100% from a revenue perspective in a year and a half. And obviously, this isn't necessarily the easiest market. We're kind of in a weird, wonky uh, overall market. And so to say the B2B side has grown 100% in a year and a half, that's amazing, right? Like, usually you see some sort of like stumbling after an acquisition and merger. And we've seen the opposite, the not just growth, top line growth but revenue per member, activation per member, in overall engagement, like those metrics look like a hockey stick. And we were a fairly mature business in terms of, you know, we're not some young company, we've been around for years. So to all of a sudden, the linear growth, dot, 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 acquisition, and then hockey stick growth afterwards shows you how well this is done. And Lindsay has got an amazing marketing mind, Russell is a engineering and operations genius. And then we really brought that sales side. It's been, like I said, it's, it's been a, a symphony for sure. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. I think there's, there's so many pieces of that when you start to dive into like what's happening, why it's working, what enables you to, to see that type of growth. From the outside, I think oftentimes when people think about B2B and utilizing healthcare benefits and trying to get buy-in for, from some of these plans and providers. It's like, it's oftentimes an afterthought to have an enterprise business that you try to, you know, hopefully get employers, insurers, whoever to buy into, and maybe they use it, maybe they don't, maybe it's working, maybe it's not. Uh, hopefully they continue to, to pay so you can have that revenue stream from your standpoint and how you think about this, obviously have been immersed in this for a number of years, like actually having a meaningful change and impact. You mentioned some of those engagement numbers, the, the, the kind of uh, scaling that within these organizations. What does that look like in terms of what they're engaging with? What, what types of content programming is working? And, and you even mentioned this ability to kind of create almost customize. I wouldn't say custom, but uh, spin it up based on where the demand is for these different populations. How are you approaching that in terms of like making sure that this is full utilization and, and really success above and beyond other enterprise or B2B kind of offerings? So there's a handful of metrics I'll, I'll point to, and I'll try to walk them through and keep it interesting for everybody listening. So the first is we utilized third parties on our digital component of legacy peer fit before, before the deal. Obviously, from the time that we announced, before we actually merged the platforms, we just had a handshake and let PeerFit users go over to fit on, right? From the time that we made that available, I think it was about a month afterwards, we're looking at the data. We had 4X the amount of people activate their fit on account. Then we had our previous digital vendor for the last two years. So two years worth of third party versus one month with fit on, and it was 4X. That was the first like, oh, this is a really good product, right? Like people really, really like it. Then the next metric that we looked at was new activations of existing members. So not new clients, new rollouts. These are like people that have had access to the platform for weeks, months, and years. And it was something like 92% of the new activations were from the digital side, going to the fit on app side. Meaning I had access to in-person for weeks, months, years, eh, wasn't, wasn't calling me, right? But of all those net new activations, it was, ooh, this fit on app is really appealing to me. And that was the piece that activated them. Like those metrics so early on post deals, like, wow, okay, we, 
we got something here. And then when you think about the world pre-COVID, post-COVID, and I, the reason why I'm po doing this is like during COVID, everybody went to digital. And, and so the question was like, how sticky is digital post? Now, there are p other people in the industry who've seen their usage fall off a cliff, right? Ours not only stayed stable from all fit on users, right? Like it's very, very stable. But then when we on the B2B side, which has predominantly always been in person, how did we see the usage on digital? Before we put fit on inside of the experience, generally, let's call it 5% of our usage was going to digital. And then be right before we had fit on in the platform, it was back to 5% again. So like you had the COVID peak and it's back down to 5%. Uh, I think six months after having fit on, it was at 24% of usage was on digital. So, I mean, you're talking 5X of what we had, what we had seen. So we had a lot of like pre post comparison. There, there wasn't a, there was nothing to compare to. We had legitimate pre post comparisons to say, wow, this is a, this has been a game changer, like legitimate game changer. The deal closed in February uh, of last year. And the first thing that Lindsay went and did, right, like I said, she's a great marketing mind. She, she runs all of filming our content. We do it in-house and Lindsay runs that, was let's film one of these courses for balance and fall prevention for our senior market, right? 49% of our B2B business is in the Medicare business, right? So 65 and over. And all those courses mainly were for under 65 focuses and conditions. And we said, let's start doing this. And so now... When we're pitching to a health plan, we'll say, what's on your mind, right? We can move much faster than you. We can produce Hollywood level videos much quicker and cheaper than you can. What's on your mind? What should we be filming for you, right? That's powerful uh, in comparison to everyone else in the industry. And then now, like, I love it because like I didn't build Fit, Fit On, the consumer app. And so I always can be very objective on my like, and what I'm impressed with, because I didn't build it, right? It's one thing for me, like, hey, Peter, it's really good. Well, I built it. I, I hope I think that, right? So I always am, when I'm pitching to the health plans, they're like, look at all these amazing celebrities, right? Like, I'm in awe that I get to use them in advertising and marketing. And I was I'm like, you come work with us. You got Gabby Union, right? And and if you didn't see the pictures, we were just at, at Health, probably one of the largest healthcare conferences every year. And we hosted a private dinner with Giada De Laurentiis because we were just launching a partnership where she's putting recipes on the fit on platform. And once again, like to tell all these health plans, Hey, why don't you come out with us and do private dinner at Jada's restaurant? Jada's going to show up. She can take pictures with all of you. She's going to make the dinner, you know, for you. Like that's just a game changer that you don't see all that often in the B2B vendor space, right? Health plans have that kind of money where they can go get, like you've seen Queen Latifah talk for one of the big plans and stuff like that. But for us to be able to do that, it just put us in a completely different light. I think for the health plans, we're like, wow, like they're bringing a lot to the table and they're constantly, constantly innovating. And here you are a year and a half later, we just were, we were with a group, a health plan who we've been working on for a while. And they said, man, I, we met with you guys six months ago and you've done this, you've done this, you've done this. And, and you, you told us you were going to, but you actually did it. And that's where once again, Russell's product mind and execution mind is such a lift for us. We were we were a good product team, but he is an elite mind on that. And it just it look it makes selling a whole heck of a lot easier when you've got that kind of firepower behind you for sure. Yeah, it's it's operationally and experience, but also the focus and commitment to innovation and resources and marketing that to your point, it's like not necessarily the same in like the B2B vendor, Medicare, Medicaid, like senior market that like- Certainly I'm not the Medicare side, <laughs> like certainly not. Yeah, that, that doesn't exist. And I think part of that too, you kind of mentioned to it, like uh, the nutrition aspect, obviously the fitness, the fall prevention and balance. So a wide variety of content that, that definitely pairs with now this expectation from a consumer perspective on like holistic health and wellness. What are some of these categories that you're seeing performing super well, ones that you're excited about, others that maybe are launching? Like, how do you think about, you know, what is being put into the platform from a content perspective? You mentioned, right, the ability to like create things, customize almost bespoke, like based on the the inbound that you're getting, but also what's on the roadmap that you're saying like, oh, 
we're executing against this. I'm really excited about like the kind of direction that it's going. Yeah, when I when I think about the platform, there's generally three focus areas. One is digital content, right? So think of traditional fit on side. The second is in-person networks and experiences. And the third are chronic condition management. When I think of digital content, what started as exercises or workouts, right, has gone so wide and deep. The nutrition section of the of the platform is really, really robust and people love it. The meditation, the stretching, right? So things that are more than just exercises. We uh, ingest a lot of data from wearables so we can do different challenges. We launched step challenges, which I know is like wellness 1.0 from 20 years ago. But I'll tell you when you're doing the other things and then you also have that versus only doing that. I mean, our team has become obsessed with the well, the step challenges are like the B2B fit on health team are weirdly obsessed with these walking challenges, but it just shows you in the right enterprise setting when you're also doing those other things, like how good those challenges and rewards can be. So we've really started to churn out more challenges. And that, like I said, in the beginning, it was just fitness, take 10 workouts. Then it was steps. Then it was, hey, why don't you look at these meditation-based ones, self-gratitude challenges. We do a lot of partner series. I know this was a big question, you know, listen to this podcast during COVID. It was, is it in person? Is it digital? How will they coexist? And we always thought like the user will become comfortable with both and, and move back and forth. So then it was, well, how will these digital players and the in-person players interact? And I think what Lindsay and Russell had done such a good job of, if you go to our partner section, we're filming videos on our platform with 24 hour fitness with orange theory with Zumba. And so it was a beautiful marriage of like these in-person brands lending their trainers and styles for some partner workout series on our platform. Right. So I think we just launched, uh, you know, like the surf one, which is really, really cool. So that's that first bucket. The second is in-person experiences. That's just block and tackling amazing, you know, whether it's big box gyms or you know studios, and now having this component in the growth gives us once again a lot of leverage to go into how can we be a better partner? Before the deal, it, the negotiations price and only price. How big are you and how much are you gonna pay us? Now it is maybe we can give your members access to the platform. Maybe we can film some digital content for you, right? So it's more of a three-dimensional uh, discussion rather than a one-way negotiation. And then lastly, the area that we've been investing in is condition management, right? So fall prevention, diabetes management, which is a function of strength. It's fitness. It's, you know, kind of the approach. It's nutrition. So how does nutrition play a piece in that? And so I think what we're most excited about are adjacencies to core physical activity. And I always make this joke, I'm over the age of 30. I'm fairly certain you are too, right? When you say you can't exercise your way to great health after the age of 30, right? Before then, your body kind of is like, oh, you ate Taco Bell, no big deal, right? But after the age of 30, you start noticing it, you start feeling it, it starts slowing you down. Mentally, you can feel it. And so we think that nutrition and physical activity are just the most natural pairing in to our, to our members, right? That's the thing that, that hits everybody is all of a sudden one day, you're like, hmm, I'm doing the same exercises I've always done, but it's hitting me differently with the weight, with my soreness, with how I'm feeling sluggish. Uh, and so that's the thing people have questions about. That's the area of the platform that grew most organically was that nutrition side. So we do have some services we'll be launching, not public yet, but it is all around the nutrition area. And, and I would say, I know you didn't ask it, but I'll bring it up. It's like, when you think about the broader market from a partnership and an M&A perspective, that's probably been the area we've had the most conversations about. Both like us looking to buy or groups that have tried to acquire us is like this intersection line between physical activity and nutrition opens treasure troves of outcome-based reimbursement, value-based reimbursement. So, you know, one thing that this business has done is as you put a direct-to-consumer and B2B business together, 
we had to pick a lane. Like, what is the future of the business? And the future is healthcare. The 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 future is healthcare. No 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 bones about it. And consumers still they are still focus on consumer. But when you think like who's the primary driver, it's it's B two B healthcare for sure. Hey everyone, we'll get you back to the show in just a second. But first, I wanted to tell you about our exclusive PR partner, Jack Taylor. Honestly, this one's a no-brainer. We've known the Jack Taylor team for years. They work with some of the most innovative health and wellness companies. We're talking Whoop, Athletic Greens, Hyperice, and many more. Jack Taylor has an extensive industry network, knows how to work with high-growth companies, and really invest in building long-term relationships. I know this firsthand because they're Fit Insider's PR agency, so I can confidently recommend them, and I do all the time. From startups to more established brands, they go beyond pushing product to help companies truly thrive. To learn more, head to fit.co slash Jack Taylor. That's F-I-T-T dot C-O slash Jack Taylor. Now back to the show. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think about who cracks that code. Because even to this point, you're mentioning like the interest in the intersection of nutrition and fitness, physical activity. The fact that they're siloed and fractured now and have been for the kind of history of the industry is like banana. It's crazy that like <laughs> that it's been that way. And the same goes, even if you were to group those two things, like then the jump to healthcare reimbursements, pr- prevention, like if, if subsidy, like anything about it is like, how are those so disjointed that there's no connectivity between them? So we're, now we're starting to see this, you know, food is medicine, medically tailored meals, everything, personalized nutrition, all of which is fantastic, right? As much as we can get, we'll take to improve health outcomes. And same thing when it gets to physical activity, it's like walking, you know, hiking, being outdoors, every like the benefits, mental health. There's no denying, there's no arguing like, it's, it's what our body needs. Like we, we need to do it. We need to be outside. We need to be physically active, but now it's kind of getting to this space of like exercise is medicine. Like how do we quantify it? What is the programming? How do we know that it works? What routines work, which I think is an interesting shift and all that to say, like you, I think individually, personally, and then within this business are uniquely positioned to say like, Hey, here's how all these pieces kind of fit together and healthcare pay this person B to B over here and put it together in a way that like, oh, we can pay for this or we can incentivize or we can do prevention. Um, how close, I don't know if it's timing, I don't know if it's roadmap, just maybe even just your perspective. Like, how close is that to actually happening in a way where I think at a high level it often gets talked about as like sick care versus healthcare or prevention and like all these pieces, like how do we actually connect those dots in a way where all the work that we're doing as an industry and you're doing, you know, within the business, like it actually ladders up to that thing where it's like, oh, they make sense in a way where incentives are aligned. So there's a saying, you can be right or you can get what you want, but you rarely can get both. This will seem like a pessimistic view, but it gets us to the end point, right? Which is if you ultimately want the payers, however you define that, to pay for these types of things, right? You can get there because they thought it was a good decision, which is what we all try to push them. It's healthy. It's the way to get there. Eat right, exercise. Or there could be a more perverse way that they still get there and pay for it, which is what I actually see happening. The biggest trend that is going on right now is the GLP-1s, the weight loss drugs, right? The Ozempics, the shot to, to, to lose weight became so popular. It is essentially bankrupting employers and health plans because they're so expensive. And so, A, they are very popular. B, they know that if they get people on them, they do lose weight. And if they do lose weight, generally speaking, you can make a leap to say, a lot less likely to have adverse reactions versus people who have significantly overweight. You're more likely to possibly be able to walk and eat right and so on, right? And so what happens as a means of control is you have groups saying you, in order to get this reimbursed shot number two or shot number three or so on, you have to prove that you're participating in a nutrition program, a physical activity program, something, right? And so now, rather than health plans going and saying, hey, I want to pay for physical activity and nutrition because they're the right thing to do, what they're saying is, 
okay, I'll pay for that if you are going to do your GLP-1 shot or you're going to lose weight. And basically it's like, it's almost like now that is the intervention that they are prescribing for another reason. And if you can get over the fact that, fine, that's why they're doing it, great, because it gets people into our programs and it gets people hopefully building habitual pathways of eating healthy, of exercising, of just having movement. And I think, you know, you can attest this, like once that just becomes part of your life for a certain number of months, you're in, right? There's this weird like three to six month area. And if you can make it out of that six months, generally speaking, it, it, it becomes a habit for you. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. To see how that how those things are tied together. And if, it, if the, if the, the shot, the GLP ones end up being the thing that take people that first step into changing their habits. And because that is the question, I don't want to go too far down that path. I, we can definitely put that up there in the conversation of what are the preeminent trends that are shaping the broader landscape right now? Like put that up there, but like pairing it with exercise and nutrition to lead to bring about sustained behavior change. It's like, that is the only way, or like this whole thing doesn't work at all. And then we're all kind of back to square one, which like you could see how that could be a pretty, you know, whiplash moment of like, everybody's taking these shots. Nobody's doing the behavior change. They get off of them. Here we are again. Uh, Yeah. So yeah, whether that's, to your original point, my question, like if that's the thing that gets us where we need to go, maybe it wasn't the reason or the intention that we all had to begin with, but it could certainly be on that path to, uh, you know, shifting the landscape since we're, since we're already going down these tracks, if we put that out as one of the trends that are kind of defining things we've in the past, both on the show and off, like talked about what is shaping the industry at times, obviously pandemic COVID this in person at home, hybrid consolidation, M and a funding, all the tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that flowed into the space for a two year period that seemingly is not available right now. When you're talking about the, the broader fitness kind of space, wellness in general, what else GLP ones aside, do you look at and say like, wow, this is, this is what it's about right now. Here's what's top of mind or what I'm watching. Yeah, I think the most obvious trend is you're seeing a lot of market leaders in siloed areas that are great B2B health. And a lot of us sell to the same people, but we sell very different categories that are somewhat adjacent or not adjacent. And so there's certainly talk of people saying, here are two businesses that maybe on their surface don't even do complementary things, but the infrastructures are the same. The clients are the same. Is it worth putting these businesses together? Right. That's conversations I've certainly been a part of. Those are conversations I've heard from other people. There, there is only so many really good, really successful groups that do what we do in terms of like good at B2B in your category. And then there's like, there's such a large gap between like, number one and two, and then everybody else in all those categories. And the drying up of funding has made that gap even worse, right? So it, it, I look, I don't know the answer to this, but it, I will be curious to watch unlikely bedfellows that on their surface, their products and services aren't the same, but because their infrastructure and delivery you know, method of their product is similar, who end up coming together. And like, I'll, I'll give an example that has nothing to do with our direct space. But do you remember when CVS bought Aetna? Everyone was like, what? A drugstore and an insurance company. And then all of a sudden you had, is Walgreens going to get bought by this group? Is Walmart going to go by this group? And it like forced the industry to react to see who was going to buy who. I, f- I have a feeling you're going to see a couple of those on the vendor side some groups that come together where you've got categories where there's only one or two, like two at the top. One does it to try to differentiate and now the other one plays copycat. That's probably what you're gonna see. And the other trend is you had a spike of funding in 2020, 2021 in digital health and now it's kind of troughed out. 
And then you have groups waiting and delaying their uh, IPOs. Well, you need to show growth going into a public offering, even if it's inorganic. So I think you even see some of these bigger groups probably going to need to purchase something that they ordinarily wouldn't have thought of purchasing in the fact that groups have less funding, groups need to grow. Those are the physics of life sometimes that make acquisitions happen. Even from like a, because I agree, you see, we've kind of talked about it in the past is like this everywhere, care, retail, entering healthcare, entering primary care, you name it. Uh, same thing with now kind of some very publicly, some not as publicly, but certainly doing it like grocery stores, getting into wellness, personalized nutrition, food as medicine, like all these sorts of things if it's not specific companies industry or segment, how do you see that playing out? Is it like a, I mean, in the past we've seen, you know, active wear company, Lululemon try to make this digital fitness thing work. Didn't go so hot, so on and so forth. Do you see it in this healthcare to more consumer fitness wellness space? Is it technology players now trying to get into what is the content game? Like, how do you think about the pairings, even if it's like at a, 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 a top level? I will say, like 2017, I went to Vancouver and pitched Lulu on why they should do in-person and digital as a whole strategy to their members. But I guess that's a whole, that's another story one day. I mean, look, you saw Nike opening stores and doing equipment now. I, I think, look, I'm going to give you a very similar answer on the last one, but I'll be more descriptive on this, which is, Sometimes you get the answer you want, not because they agreed with you, but for a completely different reason and just accept it. Medicare, for a lot of people who don't realize, kind of drives the bus on how U.S. healthcare funding works. Usually everything is based off of what Medicare chooses to reimburse and how much, and then everything flows from there. And so even if you're under 65, you don't realize that the decisions of reimbursement typically are done from the Medicare side. Medicare is going through this like awakening in terms of what it thinks it should be. If you think about, for those of you like confused Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare is the over 65 insurance, right? And Medicare Advantage is the private insurance portion of, of Medicare. And they went from decades of just being health insurance to all of a sudden in the late 20 teens saying, hey, let's add groceries on there. Let's do a flex card where they get a spending account. Let's pay for glasses. Let's pay for dental. Let's start, like they just started adding all these services. So you saw like Instacart come into this space and people are like, what the heck is Instacart doing in Medicare? Well, if Medicare is paying for groceries and grocery delivery, <laughs> go there, right? So as Medicare allocates funding to things, that is where you will see people go, in my opinion, right? It's fun to see the sexy brands like Nike say, ooh, we're going to do an in-person studio. Great. That's like a one-off thing, right? But when you see the funders of the economy, which are healthcare, drives the economy in so many ways, when they make decisions to reimburse things, people go where the funding is at, which means that's where you see the change at. So that's where I see a lot of the downstream implications is watching because we're in the over 65 space as well. Watching what Medicare is doing and how they're reimbursing for things uh, has huge impacts. And I'll give one downside to that. So it sounds like, oh, Medicare is a great place to be and there's just tons of funding. That was true for the last two years. And then this year, there was a snap back to reality, right? The hangover always comes. And this year, Medicare really reined in the spending, what the reimbursement levels were going to be, and actually ended up slow walking how harsh it was going to be because the plans were having a heart attack, that they were going to take a huge, huge reimbursement hit. And then Medicare stair-stepped the, over the next few years, the reductions. So even that's going to have an implication, right? If funding is drying up in certain areas, now all of a sudden those won't be as important. So it isn't necessarily the sexiest business to be in, but it's certainly right now one of the most interesting business to be in. And for us, where like fitness in the Medicare space, you basically had two legacy players had the same product for 20 years. And for us to be able to come in and be as disruptive as we have been in a handful of years, I think just shows you the thirst 
that was there for any new product, let alone our kind of like top tier product in anything that doesn't have the word silver in it. So yeah, yeah, silver sneakers, YMCA. It's it's so like the still to this day the the, the kind of picture and marketing and branding is like seniors in an aquatics class, like doing uh, water aerobics. And it's just like, Hey man, that's real though. You still have this, like we're, we have a great partnership with the YMCA because like you're in that market. That's real deal important to the seniors and, and to the, the plans themselves. So I, I want to say like the Y has actually been an amazing partner to us ever since we entered the, the MA space. And they have been behind us in a way that they've not been behind the other players. And, and like I said, look, we've always tried to think of ourselves as how do you be a good partner to all stakeholders? Uh, anytime, like I said, you're in a symmetrical argument or negotiation, n- literally no one's going to win, right? It's a race to the bottom. So being able to make this full circle, bringing the two businesses together, right? We have a lot more to offer on the table than just, hey, we've got lives and we want to reimburse you X and you want Y. Yeah, we'll we'll get you out of here as we wrap up the conversation in a minute here. But even to that point, like of the YMCA's, I always went talking about it. You know, one of my first jobs as a personal trainer was in a YMCA, and then went on to be like a, a wellness and fitness director at a YMCA, and and like then getting an experience at like the the kind of Y uh, US level to see like the work that was being done. It's like to your point about some of the things that like, that aren't sexy, like, no, it's not a sexy business and no, they don't have the branding and the classes and all the, you know, equipment necessarily that some of the premier brands have, but it's like the populations and people and the, like what they deliver is like, that is the ground floor of like physical activity, community, social wellness, like, and uh, no real point there other than, you know, mentioning it is like, because, it it comes up so often when I think about like how that shaped the perspective sometimes that can get lost when you talk about all this digital and funding and consumer and this and that. It's like they're stalwarts. They've been around, man. Not only that, it's like and you have this perspective as well. It's like, have you ever like been in a gym training someone who's like, you know, a grandma from like a, you know, not well off kind of community. And it's like talking to her about what she thinks health and fitness and wellness and happiness and all those things are versus like what sometimes gets portrayed uh, and, and marketed. And it, it kind of gets to that point as well of like bringing these two businesses together to, to kind of provide what is comprehensive and, and, uh, kind of across demographics and, and ages and all those things. It's, it's really interesting to think about how that plays together. Well, because they've been around for so long and they're so important. I mean, look behind you, for those of you who are watching Pittsburgh behind you, I know you guys are Pittsburgh boys. It's like, this was a public thing. This isn't a secret. It's like the Pittsburgh YMCA chose to end its relationship at one point with those legacy fitness vendors on the over 65 side and caused national news what one of the silvers doesn't have the Y in greater Pittsburgh, catastrophic, right? Like that was huge headline news in our industry. It was years ago. And I can remember still to this day, one of the very big plans on the towers in your city, talking to them saying like that, we still feel that pain today, all these years later from when, you know, the Pittsburgh Y was like, mm, we're not going to work with you. Right. So it's it, like I said, we, we have such a, a fortunate position. Like we get to talk to health plans and, and see what they see. We have to talk to our members and see what they see. And the fitness experiences, those big groups, the why 24 hour fitness, like LA fitness groups who we've had years of being great partners all the way down to the one off mom and pop, you know, own cycling studio. We've had a very fortunate run of having a three-sided marketplace where we get to hear and see ideas, suggestions, sometimes criticisms, you know, from all of them. And honestly, that's what I'm most proud about all these years later, right? All these years later is that we still have a reputation for being a good partner and not overly being pulled by the plans, by the gyms, by the members. Like we've been able to be a good broker for everyone's outcome, knowing that to your point, like 80% of the people like what health and activity just like getting to is like, they're not, they're not us. They're not people who live to go to the gym. Like, it's just like, Hey man, 
if I can get to the gym twice and be active, that's a huge win. So I'd, I'd say like kind of all things considered looking backwards, like it's, it's still humbling that this team that we've put together, who's mostly still here is, is still doing that and doing it with the same expectation, passion, you know, consistency all these years later. Yeah. It's, it's also, it's great to see building that infrastructure and foundation and inroads and then continuing to build on that in a way that is in many ways, defining what that, that relationship between the two, the healthcare, fitness kind of wellness looks like and getting to continue to do that. So yeah, glad we got the the download and to catch up. We, we will have to do it again. Not, I don't know what, three plus years. Yeah. It took, it took us uh, three plus years here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for folks who are listening, they want to learn more website, social, get in touch, any type of call to action, where would you point people? Yeah, go, go to the Fit On app. It's amazing. There's uh, there's certainly a free version. We have the pro version that people can can upgrade to, but it, there's literally no reason. Go download the Fit On app. It's available on your phone, on your computer. Heck, you can use it on almost every smart TV uh, that's out there. And if you want the pro version by your employer, tell them to reach to, to Fit On Health. We're happy to help. Perfect. Encourage everybody to reach out. Ed, thanks so much for the time. I'm excited to share this conversation. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. One more thing before you head out, help us spread the word. Take a minute to rate and view the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, or share this episode with a friend. And if you like conversations like this, you'll love the Fit Insider newsletter. We send it every Tuesday. The link is in the description. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you back here next week.